Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for making the time. And um, yeah, I'd like to share. Um, yeah, so I'm Afi. I'm the CEO of Okra. And basically, I'm going to share with you today uh, the lessons um, and the path forward that we see for off-grid electrification in Cambodia. And so, um, Okra is a IoT technology company. So we don't typically go out in communities and install all the solar and the batteries. We uh, like to work with partners, particularly local partners, to to get it done. Um, so our customer is like the energy utilities typically, and we're focused. Um, around the world. We're operational now in Cambodia, Indonesia, and Philippines. And our goal is to make sure that everybody has reliable 24 seven uh, renewable energy access so that they can live productive technology driven lifestyles. Um, this is pretty uh, great pilot project that UNDP uh, supported us on. And um, we're, we're, we're very happy and appreciative that UNDP has provided so much support. So we wanna share um, the lessons of, of this pilot that got deployed. So I'll start by talking about the technology, what makes Okra different and uh, innovative and the gap that it fills. Uh, and then we'll go straight into the case study. Um, and we'll look at, you know, now that this case study or now that this pilot project has been deployed, um, what can we learn in terms of the cost of deployment and the cost of operation? And then we'll look at, you know, the bigger picture in Cambodia. Um, how many more households are there that we can potentially scale this out to? And you know what can uh, UNDP and us do together um, to work on achieving this scale out? And then, of course, um, happy to dis discuss in any Q and A. So, firstly, like we identified a gap, and that gap is that there are many, many areas, like all over the world, and also in Cambodia, uh, where there's like small clusters of households. They could be like you know 50 households, 200 households, 20 households. But they're in areas that are so difficult for the grid to reach. For example, uh, the Ton Lissar, that typically the only solution for them so far has been like a lighting kit or a small solar home system. And we didn't see that as a long-term solution. Like if you can't address, if you can't energize a community because I'm an island, then are these people destined to not, you know, enter the modern economy, not be able to access technology and industry? Um, so we developed a technology that enables these communities specifically to get connected to 24 seven power. So if you look at the energy framework, um, we look at productive power as being like tier three up. So tier one is like, you know, a lighting kit. Tier two is a small solar home system, which can, you know, also power like a fan or a television, but none of these things although they are having massive impact, like they're enabling people to stay up at night and have some creature comforts, they're not really enabling income generation through technology. And that's what we wanted to enable. So tier three is when you can start using like, you know, rice cooking um, and, and, and some small productive appliances. And then tier three and tier four, you move into refrigeration, power tools, water pumping. Um, and so that's what we wanted to serve or enable to serve with our technology. Tier five, although great, like air conditioning and heavy industry, um, is uh, you know a significant step up in terms of the cost. So we wanted to be able to address this problem with our technology. So how does the technology work? If I go backwards, um, our technology is basically uh, two things. One, it's this IoT device. It's a box that you install at every single household. So you've got a, effectively a solar home system, so a solar panel, a battery, and then our box. And then the innovative aspect is um, if the households are close to each other, right? So if they're far, far apart from each other, like these households, you can just install them as a standalone solar home system. Um, but if they're close to each other, like for example, in a cluster, you can take a plug and play cable from one box to the next box. And then what happens is automatically our software will determine that houses are connected. And if there's any excess power from any solar panel, it will redistribute that power to other households. So it's called a swarm grid or a mesh grid. And it's just like Lego. So for example, 
you know, the next week, if there's another 10 houses nearby that you want to connect, you can just plug them in. It's very modular. And automatically the software shares all of the power. And what does that do? Well, it means the networks are more reliable um, because if you're about to have a blackout, you can get power from somewhere else. It also means that you can use more power because you've got the shared power of all the systems. And that eventually means that you can use productive loads. For example, uh, there's high power loads such as refrigeration, uh, cooking, power tools, etc. cetera. Um, so a really interesting aspect of these swarm grids or these mesh grids is that they really, really reduce the cost of electrification uh, versus the typical way of delivering uh, power from mini grids. And the reason why is because, as you can see over here, that yellow bit, um, the largest part of uh, connecting a typical mini grid um, is actually, rather than being the solar panels and the batteries, it's the transmission and distribution. And by connecting households in multiple mesh grids, so just connecting the clusters that are close by to each other, it means you don't need to run transmission and distribution through the entire community. So you're actually reducing the largest upfront cost by setting up mesh grids. Um, and then the next thing is, because we've got this IoT device, what does IoT mean? Internet of Things, I'm sure you all know. Um, we're pulling data up um, and we're remotely controlling every single part of the network. So every single house, we can see exactly you know, how much power they're using. Um, we can determine if there's any issues. Um, for example, if a panel is shaded or a battery is damaged, um, we see this data coming through uh, to us or to the, the utility partner that owns the network. Um, so they can monitor that and, and manage their assets effectively. We also integrate with mobile money. So going out to these remote communities and operating these networks is very expensive. Um, so we have a system where uh, a local agent can basically collect money and then put in the app which house has paid uh, how much. And then that data automatically updates and a household who uh, doesn't, who hasn't paid for power uh, can get cut off from their power remotely. Um, and that encourages them to continue paying for, for electricity. And as soon as they pay and that data's come in through the app, uh, they start getting access to power again. And then a really great part of this entire model of it being very simple, um, like a plug and play system, is that local people in the community uh, can actually do the payment collection. They can actually do the operations and maintenance um, because we can see all the issues that have happened. Um, for example, like I said, if a, if a battery uh, is damaged or if a panel uh, is shaded, this person in the community gets notified and they can actually go out and fix that, which, which creates a bunch of local jobs. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention um, is of, you know, people always say, what happens when the electricity grid uh, comes out. Um, can we utilize, reutilize the infrastructure? Are we going to be making two investments if the grid comes and there's also a microgrid? Um, so what happens in an opera network is we use a gateway. So when you look at the grid, you've got like megawatts or tens of megawatts of power being generated. When you're looking at these microgrids, you're talking like 10 to 50 to 100 kilowatts of power. So it's very, very small. Um, so we've uh, got a solution basically when the grid comes out and the grid hasn't come out yet, um, but there's a solution where basically power from the grid um, can come in to these microgrids through a gateway solution. And so when the grid does come out, let's say five years from now, we bolt on um, these gateways to the grid and then we can pull power in to the community. So we don't need to add an additional layer of infrastructure there, the infrastructure is already there. So for example, like EDC, if they're extending the grid, they can be comfortable with that. Um, they can still sell power into these communities. But right now, today, they will be able to benefit from 24 seven productive power by setting up these microgrids. Um, so that's, that's a bit about the technology. And I would like to quickly show you some data. Um, let's, let me try looking to the Harvest platform. So, what is it, Oscar Harvest? Dr. Oh, I'm not sure of the one, yep. Um, you're going to need the uh, BSD project 
um, login, I guess. Yeah. Um, so it's yes, yeah, dsdproject.gmail.com. Project gmail.com. Cool. And uh, capital B, yeah, ESD project. One, two, three. Cool. Oh, shit. Again. Yes. D. One, two, three, exclamation. Exclamation mark. Yep. Awesome. Cool. So this is the Harvest platform, our software platform. And basically a whole lot of, you know, the case study is just here for, for everyone uh, who's part of this project to see. So Ministry of Mines and Energy um, obviously was the um, local partner who enabled this to happen. So log on. So the first part of the platform is uh, looking at, you know, all the money that's coming in uh, from the household, so the payments, and the utilization of the various energy packages, which I'll go into in a bit. Um, so that um, whoever owns it, let's say it's the rural electrification enterprise, or let's say it's MME, or let's say it's us, we can actually see uh, how much money is coming through. Is this network operating profitably? Um, so let's take a look over here. This is Sung Chiro. Uh, one of the communities that we uh, energized together with UNDP. And I'm going to show you some of the mesh grids. So as you can see, like this is a house that's been installed standalone. Um, these two are close to each other. So um, it, like a plug and play way, a cable was drawn from one IoT device to the next and they're sharing power. And then here's another mesh. And then here's another mesh, like a big uh, mesh and they're all sharing power one house to the next and like now you can already get an um, understanding let me see um, how their infrastructure is different um, from a traditional mini grid so in traditional mini grid you'd have like all your generation and your solar here and then you draw transmission and distribution all the way to the last house here um, but in this mesh grid, you've got multiple small mesh networks, and that's really reducing the transmission and distribution infrastructure. And you, you probably have a question, and that's like, yeah, but in a traditional mini grid, everybody gets to enjoy um, AC power output, just like they do on the national grid. Well, actually, in the Opera networks, we have um, a plug and play network with 55 volt DC distribution, which means it's low voltage and like local people can operate with it, but actually at the output at every single house, there's an inverter. So they, they can use um, 230 volts power just like they can on, on the normal grid. Um, and then I'll show you some of the maintenance. Let's see if there's any insights. So basically um, this is Sanctuary, this is live data, and it comes, it's running analytics on every single household. And our algorithms are telling us if there's any issue. So fixed faulty wiring, solar, panel is not producing power. So basically that means that there's an issue, it's obvious what the issue is, and then the local person in the community can actually go out there um, and fix that. Um, and because they get such a simple um, command, rather than looking at all of this data, which is in the back end, right? This is probably like, you know, freak people out, be like, whoa, what are all these, like, crazy lines and charts and things. They don't have to look at that. All they see is that um, there is faulty wiring, panel is not producing power based on the algorithm that we've got. So that helps um, operate and maintain um, the network. So yeah, just wanted to show you that. And um, there's actually like a few, we've not only connected Sanctuaro, it's part of this UNDP project. We also connected Prixpian, which is on the other side of the river and uh, Taduk, which is very close by down the river. And yeah, all of these households are literally in the middle of uh, the tunnel is up. Let's take a look here, right? Biggest lake in Cambodia and then off it, you know, there's a whole bunch of small islands and yeah, we managed to energize them. So we're, 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 we're really happy um, that this managed to get done within about like six weeks of installation time. So let's look at some of the impact um, on, on the community and, and some of the economics. Maybe take some questions. Uh, 
Good afternoon, uh, participant. Maybe here or on the Zoom also. Do you have any uh, burning question to ask of me right now on the technology before we yeah. go step to the the benefit of this uh, technology to the minority or to the the vulnerable people or the community? Um, I can start if. Uh, if that's okay. Um, uh, I mean, very happy to see this result. Um, uh, I actually uh, lied to you a little bit earlier when you asked me if I had worked with energy. So before I joined for a few months, I was working together with Wuti on this. And uh, for instance, I was part in choosing the Stone Crow uh, village as a target uh, village. And I think that was seems to have been uh, at least a good Part that I was contributing with. You made, you made it hard for us. Yeah, I'm sure. But uh, <laughs> the idea was that we were going to electrify a, a place which wouldn't uh, get the grid connection very soon. Yeah. Um, so combining uh, several goals with this. Uh, but so you said there is actually so that you have done uh, three uh, different small villages uh, and and in total 140 households. Is that's that, right yeah okay that's good um my, my, my question you you were talking a little bit and what happens when the big grid is coming yeah. uh and and uh, then you said okay uh you can then just pull in more electricity so they get more power to the villages um but how would this be economic business relations work there would you buy the electricity from EDC and then you would sell it further or would the uh, the people become customers of EDC or what would happen in in that scenario in the future? Yeah, so I, I guess I'll start with a bit of background um, in that rural electrification is very expensive, right? So uh, there's, as you guys were there for the report from TTA, um, around uh, last mile electrification of the roughly 60 on 120,000 households that remain to be energized. Where grid extension is the least cost, it still costs about 51 cents per kilowatt hour, right? And that's just because the last mile is, is very expensive. Um, so that, that's something to keep in mind. The cost of electricity is, is quite expensive even from the grid. So. Um, our model is like we actually provide um, technology to the REEs, right, or to the local license holders. They would actually be the owner of these networks. So this pilot project with UNDP was to demonstrate how the technology works, how much it costs, and what the cost of delivering power will be and, and how much power they can get. But if we scale this out, um, we would likely have the REEs who are owning these networks and then when the electricity grid comes out, the RE would likely purchase that power from EDC and then sell it back to their customers, right? Um, and because EDC is very, um, or not EDC, all the regulators are very um, adamant about making sure that the last mile, um, the, the people in these rural areas, they pay the subsidized rate, they don't pay higher than others. Um, even though the cost of generation could be, you know, anywhere up to like 50 cents, I presume EDC would sell it to the RE at a much lower rate, uh, something like um, 730 real per kilowatt hour. Um, so that's that's how I think this this would work. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think maybe I open a pretend or e to some of our audience the non uh, non the core working on the energy or e is the rural electric electricity enterprise. Uh, to be uh, noted. And another question from Rani is the, does it require internet to connect uh, for this uh, grid? Afi? Yeah, so we require some form of connection, not like high speed internet, but as long as there's 2G. So if they can receive and send an SMS, uh, then these devices can connect. And we need that so we can get the, the, the data and also so we can control the network. So for example, if a house hasn't paid and they need to get temporarily cut off, that happens through the 2G network. Any more questions? Open the deck here. To, to operationalize this, uh, you know, micro, uh, do they have a license from the government? So, 
uh, for this particular project. Yeah, so we really appreciate the work that UNDP did here in, and not, not just UNDP, it was also UNDP, EAC, and MME. So they put a lot of work in to come up with a model um, that was approved by all the regulators and legal. And so um, basically MME is, MME, EAC, and OPERA are combining together to create a committee um, and then that committee, which also involves, sorry, the community, right? The people that will locally maintain and operate the network um, together were responsible for like the on ongoing sustainability of this project. But it's a, it's a special project. Typically you will need to get a license from the EAC or already have a license. So this is a special pilot project that UNDP helped um, negotiate with these stakeholders. I'll take it one more from that. Um, so, what are your plans or, or so to speak, possibilities that you see to, um, you know, roll this out on, on a larger scale in Cambodia, in rural areas, yeah. and what would be the obstacles for doing it? Yeah, cool. So, I think I can, I can go through that in the next couple of slides. Actually. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it's going to be a fun uh, challenge, but I think... Um, there's, a, there's a big opportunity to make a lot of impact and get energy to a lot of people really, really quick. Um, but we will, we will need everyone to work together. So hopefully you can help, help us out on that journey as well. So I guess some top, top line numbers is this pilot project, um, from when we signed the contract, it took us about six weeks to complete the entire install in three villages, which are like literally like you have to take boats and go off road and it's very challenging to get to these areas. Um, so it, it demonstrates like how this plug and play technology can be uh, used really rapidly. Um, the cost per connection was about $660 and the ongoing operations and maintenance cost, um, which uh, includes local maintenance agents is about $25 per household per year. Um, of the 140 households connected, 48 are already using electric cooking appliances. So that's offsetting uh, chopping firewood, uh, fumes at home equivalent to smoking half a packet of cigarettes a day. Um, and particularly the, the, the women are benefiting a lot from this cooking. And we received some positive news the other day that one of the households uh, had to get cut off from power. Um, and that's because they were just using so much power, cooking so much, uh, making lots and lots of rice. Um, so it's showing that, you know, when there is power, the people start using it and they change, change their way of life for the better. And um, yeah, there's three local people who are now fielding the requests and actually uh, doing the maintenance at the site, which, which is awesome to see. Um, this, uh, if, if you're interested, is this is how the pricing works and a bit about the technology here as well. So um, we, because we can control these devices, like we can use software to um, set packages basically. So it's a meter and we can say that, all right, we know we've only got this much capacity in the network because we've only installed this many panels and batteries. So to make sure that the network stays up at 99.5% um, plus reliability, we need to set some form of limits on the households. So there's like a 240 watt hour limit for some households, um, 450 watt hours for some households and 1.8 kilowatt hours for some households. What does that mean? That means like they can use power and they know which um, package they're on and they can use power. And as it gets towards their limit, uh, towards 90% of their limit, they get an SMS automatically saying, hey, you've used 90% of your power, um, please reduce your power consumption because otherwise when you hit the limit, the software is going to temporarily cut you off until the next day. Um, and that means that people know how much their limit is and the network stays up and no one gets blackouts. For example, if you have a refrigerator and you're on the 1.8 kilowatt hour package, you know you're going to be able to get that power. Then we've got another cool feature, which is when you do hit your limit, um, what if you need more power? Well, you can actually use more power using a boost feature if the power is available. And I'll explain that in a bit. But in terms of the tariffs, uh, there's two tariffs. One is 610 real per kilowatt hour, one is 730 real per kilowatt hour. This is uh, the EAC um, subsidized um, and regulated uh, tariff for, for rural people. This is how the boost feature works, because um, I thought it was pretty interesting. 
basically a house hits 100% of their energy limit and the software cuts them off from power. Um, if they want to use more power, um, we can enable that if there's excess power in the network, it's good for them to use more, right? Maybe they're having a party or something. So they hold down the button for three seconds and if there's excess power, they'll get a notification on the screen um, and they can always check how much power and how much of their limit they've used on their screen. Um, if there's enough power, they say, yes, I want to use more and then they get to boost power, um, which means like you, you optimize for both things. You optimize for being able to use as much power as you want uh, for like parties or, or like water pumping or whatever it is. But also you make sure that, you know, if the power is not available, they can't boost, which keeps the network at really, really high reliability, which is important. This is uh, what it looks like. I'm not sure if you can see closely, but none of the households had solar um, installed really over here. Um, maybe a few households. And now every single one has big systems and they're all connected together with cables and power is sharing from house to house, um, optimizing and basically keeping all the batteries charged and whoever needs more power is sharing it down to them. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, so yeah, quick overview on the, on, on the case study. Um, like, yeah, I've, I've gone over all of these things, but I think the last one is one to focus on. Um, modularity and scalability of the network. So not only do we have households on this distribution, but over time, let's say over the next two years, all of these households um, say, I want more power, I want more power, I want more power, um, because I want to use rice cooker, water pump, et cetera. Uh, that's completely fine. Um, we can just plug in more, more batteries and more panels and it contributes to the shared network. And typically in AC, you have to do like frequency and phase management and it's quite difficult to add more capacity. Uh, in DC, you don't have that issue. So you just plug in more capacity. And as I mentioned, they get AC power at the output. Um, keep in mind, like a normal solar home system, like a uh, system that's like normally distributed under like government programs will give you about this much power. And now we've got people using like, you know, eight times that much power from this microgrid. So here are the economics of this and a comparison of the uh, different, different technologies. So um, we've got some, some data that we saw from the um, report that our three eyes pushing out and we went to the conference to see that the other other week around uh, grid extension and AC mini grids and solar home systems. And so for grid extension, we can see for, for the areas where it's least cost to extend the grid, their forecast has a levelized cost of electricity of 51 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, but I, there are obvious benefits to having the grid, which means you're pretty much like you can just continue to draw power um, and scale up whenever you need. Um, but the grid is not really plug and play. It's quite challenging to install. But nonetheless, where the grid can go, it makes sense for the grid to go there. Um, we don't refute that. That's, that's just over here for a comparison. Um, according to their analysis, um, AC mini grids um, to provide 600 watt hours a day of output costs $911 per connection. So that's a centralized mini grid. And that would um, have a 59 cents per kilowatt hour levelized cost of electricity. Um, and it's not really plug and play. It's like high voltage and you need like, you know, pretty experienced EPC companies to be able to install it and also operate it. Um, you've got solar home systems, which um, we've seen a lot of, and um, they enable about 250 watt hours a day of power. Um, and according to their report, is about $500 um, to provide one of these systems. The power is a lot higher cost here because, you know, it's a smaller system. But for isolated households, it typically makes sense to do a solar home system. Um, Okra, which is what we just showed you and what, what was really awesome that we managed to achieve in this pilot project is we have a demonstrated cost per connection, which is already installed, of $668. Um, and that includes the uh, inverter and it's 620 without the inverter. Um, and this is giving an average capacity of 940 watt hours per day. Um, and that means some households will use less, some households will use a lot more. 
but this is enabling, you know, where solar home systems are basically like lighting fans and television. This is like, you know, water pumping, refrigeration, cooking, power tools, households can really be productive and enter the modern economy. And we're looking at an LCOE of about 39 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, grid connect, we can draw from the grid, but we cannot send, from, send to the grid. But I don't think it really makes sense to send to the grid. There's megawatts on the grid and you've got kilowatts in this microgrid. So the grid's gonna, the microgrid's gonna need more power. It's not gonna need to send power. And yeah, it's plug and play. Like local people in the community can operate it and also scale it. So I think this is actually, you know, very interesting and positive data that we've got uh, from this project and something that we can all be like, really, really like proud of because we're delivering much more power at a much lower cost. And there's really the potential to scale this out. Um, did you want to jump into this part, Kisa? Yeah, sure. Cool. So, yeah, so quick introduction. Um, we've got like maybe five or 10 minutes more. And um, Kisa, who's going to be uh, staying in Cambodia and um, hopefully working with UNDP to try and scale this out, we'll talk about our, our scale out plan. Cool. So, yeah, my name is Kisa. I work uh, on project development at Okra. Uh, which means I help our partners uh, scale out their OCR projects, with either through financing or uh, picking the right structure. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to talk about how we can leverage uh, the outcome of the pilot project uh, to electrify the remaining households uh, that need electricity in Cambodia. Um, so to take a step back uh, and talk about kind of the big picture, um, the government uh, made a commitment to electrify 100% of off-grid households um, in 2006, and they made a really good uh, way on that. Um, uh, as you can see on the right, um, there's an analysis of the uh, kind of remaining areas left to be electrified and the uh, TTA re report identified that there are 60,000 uh, households um, that would be best electrified using microgrids. Um, but the EA, uh, EAC has identified that there are at least 237 very remote, hard to reach villages that would be best reached uh, with microgrids. Uh, so that would be around 33,000 households. You can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so as Afi mentioned, we took the TTA, TTA analysis on how much it would cost to electrify, uh, just focusing now on those 237 villages uh, that we uh, know for sure are the best electrified using mini grids. Um, and if we look at the cost uh, to electrify them with AC mini grids and solar home systems as highlighted in that report, and then the cost, uh, the really hard costs that we've gotten out of the pilot project um, that we've kind of demonstrated, uh, we can see that the clear kind of output is that Okra is the best solution to get these communities uh, the high power that they need to make productive use of the electricity. Um, yeah, so we've uh, thought a bit about how we can kind of make this happen. Um, and we see two, uh, kind of high level options uh, that we could move forward with. They both involve having the Rural Electrification Fund issue a tender uh, to electrify the rest of these households. And our underlying assumption here is that uh, these households are gonna be paid, paying the subsidized rate. Um, so that's that 730 real rate that Aki was mentioning. And that's what we people pay in Phnom Penh uh, or, or a lower rate than that. Um, so we can kind of dig into these two uh, structures. So the first uh, would be, as I mentioned, the REF would issue a bid uh, for the lowest cost installer installation um, of the rest of these uh, off-grid villages. Um, and that installer would be, and, and they would pay upfront, we're assuming they would pay upfront uh, the cost for procurement and installation of all the equipment that you would need and the labor uh, and, and logistics to, to get those systems off the ground. Um, and that, that work uh, would be done by a private EPC, similar to what uh, we did in the pilot. Um, we worked with Patea by Tong and Solar Naturally. Uh, so there's a few different options for, for private installers that can do that work. Uh, and then uh, engineering, procurement, and construction. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and the uh, owner operator, uh, the person that would be uh, kind of actively working on, um, yeah, operating these grids in the long term. Uh, we have proposed that that would be the REE that Afi was talking about earlier. Uh, so rural electrification enterprise. Yes. Yeah, extend the REE. Yes. Up. 
sorry about all these uh, acronyms. <laughs> um, yeah, and then uh, basically the work that they were doing on an ongoing basis to make sure that these grids are still providing uh, kind of high power to these households would be paid for by that subsidized tariff. So that lower rate um, that households are paying all over the country. Um, an al alternative to this model would be to pull in some private funding. Um, and so maybe the Rural Electrification Fund doesn't wanna fund the upfront capital um, or doesn't wanna put that out uh, upfront then we could maybe pull in a, a private sector fund um, to fund that upfront procurement and installation and have the REF pay, pay back uh, kind of that upfront investment on the long term. Uh, and then the installer, the operator, and the relationship between the household would be very similar to the last, uh, the last model, which is having the rural electrification enterprises working with, directly with the households uh, to operate and maintain grids in the long term. Um, so yeah, so those are the kind of uh, high level thoughts that we were having about the potential structures we could, we could use to move forward. Um, but we think overall, uh, kind of the key objective here would be to get uh, a tender from the Rural Electrification Fund um, that enables the lowest cost productive electrification of the remaining villages in Cambodia. Um, we think uh, that something that we could maybe work together with UNDP on would be to produce a case study to really uh, leverage the results of the pilot um, that were really positive to demonstrate kind of the case for this technology and being the best options for these communities. Um, and then it's really important uh, to connect all of the different stakeholders involved and get everyone on, uh, on the same page. And so that would be kind of uh, the next step after we've kind of made the case. Um, and ultimately kind of, yeah, culminating and getting a tender issued by the REF. Um, but we wanted to kind of open it up to discussion with you guys, see what you guys think and kind of the outcome of the pilot and, and what you think the best next steps would be as well from your end. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> and yeah, we'd love to discuss ideas for moving forward or answer any questions. Yes. Okay, thank you, Afi, and uh, thank you, Johanna. And uh, is there any question from our participant? Maybe my, my first question may, may to, to have the original question. What does the uh, OCRA stand for and what does it mean? As <laughs> 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 your founder here, I think I uh, have been working for <laughs> some months. Uh, yeah, well, Okra is uh, the, the vegetable, as you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's basically the vegetable, as you know. Like we were uh, having uh, dinner this one time, and uh, at at that point in time, the company was called like Smart Distributed IoT Electrification, and I, I don't think anyone wants to hear a name like that. And while we were trying to, while we were having dinner, we just cut the okra, and then we're like, oh, what if we call the company Okra? It's green, it's uh, healthy, and, and, and it also looks like uh, a network of, of shared uh, resources. So yeah, that's where it came from. So can you explain a little bit more how the difference between mesh and uh, mini? Uh, yeah. Mesh more bundle? What's, what's it? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, in a mini, in a mini grid, for example, Sorry? And you stumped for it. it might be a bit demonstration. Yeah. Um, I might log out and show. Uh, let me just quickly log out. This log out, yeah. Let me see. Is this going to work? If I log into my Google. You have to log into Google. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Do I have a user? Uh, it's, no, it's not going to work if you do it like that. Yeah, I don't think it works if you log into Google. Okay. All right. Well, um, let me go back to BSD. But yeah, basically, can I send something over here? It'll take me one second. Yeah. Let's let's go to the next question, and then I'll show you a diagram in a sec. If if anyone has another question, I'll be happy to address. Yeah, I can uh, come back to this with the cost. Um, yeah. What what so. The, 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 the total cost for this 140 uh, uh, household yeah. have been 
88,000, is that correct? Yeah, so that's the total CapEx cost. Um, and then on top of that, I think there was like about... Oh, I think that was... Uh, 120, roughly. Okay. Okay. 120. So another 30,000 for like transportation or materials and things on. Like. Install and transportation and okay. yeah. So that meant, so if you only counted the 88,000, then I, I calculated that to $628 per household yeah. and then it will be a few hundred more yeah uh, so and then if you then take this times thirty three thousand, so the whole uh so it's 20 million dollars to oh, to do this whole thing 22, 22 million dollars oh this you have can calculate yeah, yeah so it's not an enormous amount of money it's a lot of money how much money is it in this uh, fund that you were talking about? The fund is about $100 million, yeah. Per year. Yeah. Oh, so but they have the money for this. That, that fund goes into a few things. Fine. Some of it is um, off-grid electrification, but a lot of it is the subsidies of the last mile. So remember when we were talking about what happens if you want to buy that power, they yeah. sell that power for cheaper to the REs, or they let the REs offset some of their diesel spend to get, get lower cost of power to these households. Yeah. But you're right, it is, um, it's not a huge amount in the bigger picture. Um, and the Cambodian government has been doing a great job of uh, extending electrification and they have a goal of 100% electrification uh, as soon as possible. Um, so I think that's why we're, we're really you know, coming to UNDP and being like, look, here's the data, here's how much it costs, here's the savings. Like, can we, um, yeah, arrange, you know, facilitate a discussion with all the stakeholders to, to scale this up? So what's, what are the challenges uh, the project face? Uh, <clears throat> You know, we need to understand that well before we scaling up this uh, uh, project. Uh, maybe the uh, challenge may relate to uh, re reliable supplies, attitude of users, or the weather issue. So what are the challenges we are facing in this project and how can we build that com the confidence from that to uh, scale up the, pro the new project? Yeah, so uh, as you saw, like, um, it's not really a tech technology challenge, right? Like the reliability of these networks are actually more reliable than uh, like many, many national grids in many developing countries, right? Um, so uh, I think the challenges are um, how can we navigate the regulatory framework and um, get a solution that is uh, slightly different uh, deployed? I think that's going to be the biggest challenge um, in terms of like, yeah, installation, we've proved we can do that. In terms of operation, we've set a model where the local community is managing it. In terms of power use, we're seeing a very, you know, there's people who are using lighting, other people are using, you know, rice cookers and refrigeration. So we're seeing all of that variation. And then we mitigate for risk. So for example, when there is rainy season and there's not much uh, sun, like it's kind of, it's, it's a little bit out of our control, but we still try to mitigate that by sending SMS messages to all of the households when we predict there's gonna be um, bad generation. So like, hey, um, if you um, have any essential loads such, such as a refrigerator that you wanna make sure keeps running, then over the next week, you should reduce your power consumption. Similar to how the news just told us all, like you should get a jumper because it's going to be very cold over the next week. We, we try to do the same thing. Um, and yeah, with remote monitoring, we can see the issues before and as they're happening. So I think the technology side is very sorted. It's like we're going to now figure out how can we get this completely new technology deployed um, through existing systems. Um, in, with, 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 the, with the government partners and work with them. The main challenge to add to what um, Afi mentioned, uh, thank you very much, Afi, for walking us through this uh, and colleagues as well, keeping up information. How could we make sure 
the ref is convinced to give some sort of money that is available. If uh, EDC thinks um, or ref fund thinks they can provide some money to IEEs on a leverage to establish such kind of systems for um, those villages which are not electrified, still falls within the territory of a rural electricity enterprise, that's the best way to do. But the EDC convinced that they could they think that the grid is the only solution. As you could see the economics that were presented here, there is a need for deviating from that traditional sources of energy to off grids and because of the technology advancements, we could be able to make a change at the community level, offer uh, electricity that is more efficient uh, way of generating and at a lower cost. That's the convincing the policy uh, institutions is one of the challenge that we see. And the uh, second option is we also need to look at convincing the IEEs to go for that option by themselves. Instead of depending on someone else, it is, it, would it make sense for IEE to go for electricity that costs 39 cents to offer at 18 cents? And, but still this can be included as part of the package. But there is a limitation in the electricity regulation that only a handful of rural electricity enterprises are allowed in Cambodia to generate energy. And they're not allowed remaining IEEs. Uh, there is a, some uh, change of, of the policy, uh, electricity regulation that is needed to make sure that happen. We have been also thinking about a model where a supra IEE that comes, that means all these 237 villages can be controlled centrally by a single rural electricity enterprise because of the internet of things that they have in place. Uh, cheaper maintenance operation. Um, grid can be controlled. Even uh, household, if they want a boost power, they can press a button in their, in their uh, doorstep itself, right? So that, that we are trying to uh, come up with different business models. and. Next three to four months are very, very challenging for us, not only just um, developing this particular pilot, showcasing it, but coming up with a reasonable, convincing business model that can take on in the remaining 234 villages at least. Imagine uh, three villages that were identified, already addressed through the project, but remaining villages somehow need to be fed with some sort of a sustainable power source. Hey, Oscar, can you mean the buzzer? Can you just send me the buzzer again? Yeah. Does that? For the BSC on. Yeah, so I guess ar around that, is anyone on the call, um, like, have they had much interactions with the REF and um, work working with them? So in, in the case of this pilot, it is the government who owns the grid now. Because UNDP has paid for the grid. It's uh, not, not the grid, the, the, the solar panels, the, the little, uh, yeah, the, the mesh grid that has been put up. So UNDP has paid for it. So is that on our balance sheet? And are we going to give it to someone? Or, or is it already given to the government? No, it's all. No, it's on the government's balance sheet. Yeah, exactly. This is uh, the, the entire infrastructure is owned by MME. Yeah, they gave this infrastructure, from the ownership of the infrastructure, to the community, yeah. and there is a community committee that is going to take the ownership for operation and maintenance. Even engagement of uh, Okra as an ONDEM operator for the next two years is completely managed by. Um, by the community committee. They have the full control over the network. Um, and Butch, uh, just to comment on what you were saying about that the next four months are gonna be a big challenge to kind of make the case. Uh, Oprah is very happy and like excited to provide all of the information and, and analysis and analytics that you guys need to, to make that case. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we can provide like technical support, um, for example, remote mapping, 
microgrid costing, and then expose all the data about the energy consumption. Um, yeah, all, all, all of that, if we can support the case of um, showing uh, the RAF and, and, and the regulators the, the benefit of rolling out this solution. Another important point I'd like to add, uh, since I don't see any question online, uh, just to mention the important element of the sustainability. What happens once the grid kicks in? The, the system and the network is continued to be operating. It's more, even more sustainable, I would say. Uh, there is a huge potential for, um, for the investors in the, in the coming years to invest in such kind of an ideas. Um, and this makes more sense as a rural electricity enterprise. And we would like to have uh, a discussion with a handful of IEs as well, who could push this agenda forward. And that's where we need to convince the um, regulator, for example, uh, EAC or EDC as an utility to give more opportunity for IEEs to uh, um, roll out this model uh, wherever is possible. Yeah, and I think one thing important to note is also that um, under the, in, ma in many countries, right, like if you look at Myanmar, if you look at a uh, number of African countries, the, there have been big programs by um, donors or institutions like the World Bank to give solar home systems for rural electrification. Um, and then typically what happens is the solar home system is provided for free uh, to the household. And it's like a one shot. We pay for it, we pay $500 for it, we give it to you, it's yours. But two, there's two problems in that. One is that that solar home system doesn't um, provide enough power for, for real productive use of energy. And the second one is after two years, that battery might stop working. And then what happens? Now they've got no system and they often like revert back to like using a diesel generator or they have to go to like just like having some electricity, lighting fans, televisions to just having lighting again, right? They're going back. So this model that we've deployed um, with UNDP and MME has been very exciting because we're actually charging the households for power at a rate that the government is happy, is happy to charge. It's a subsidized rate. It's not going to cover the cost of the capital, but what it does cover is the cost of operations and maintenance. So this is a sustainable network that continues to provide power to this community on the long term. Um, and then until the grid comes out, and then at that point, you don't need to replace any more batteries because you can actually take the power for the grid, from the grid, right? So I think that's, that's really, really uh, exciting. And I hope that we can you know, ca capture these things. Um, and if UNDP is um, you know, sharing that this is the data that you've identified from this project, I think it'll be <coughs> useful for the government and also useful for, for other countries to see what we've managed to do together here. So if uh, the scale-ups done by the private sector, is it uh, workable? The problem with the private sector is the government, um, and it makes sense, but the government does not want to charge the true cost of power to rural people, right? So if you look here, even the grid extension, it costs 50 cents per kilowatt hour because you're extending the grid to a very small village. Um, and so, the actual rate that they want to charge the customer is 630 real, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, how much is that? 17 cents. And so that's a subsidized cost, which is, it's understandable because you don't want the people to have to pay more for power in rural areas, but the private sector cannot invest and charge a subsidized rate and never make their money back. So the one mechanism where the private sector can invest is this one that we showed which is if the private sector has a deal with um, the government, that the government will be an off-taker on an ongoing basis. So the private sector goes, okay, we will pay for everything. We'll arrange their installation. And um, we just want to make sure that we get our money back on an ongoing basis over, let's say, seven years or 10 years with some profit um, from an off-taker that is uh, reputable, such as the rural, rural electrification fund. 
And, and the, the private sector is actually interested in doing this. So those are the two options we came up with. Yeah, I think one of the key challenges that Abby mentioned there is, is really kind of shifting the mindset of the REF from doing electrification projects like solar home system rollouts, which are simple and quick to do, is the same amount they're done, but are not, don't provide a long-term solution for the household. We even saw in Suntro itself, uh, solar home systems that have been rolled out some years before by the REF that were no longer working. They're just sitting there in the household, no point doing anything. So I think it's, it's very understandable that they want to be able to just do something quick like a solar home system rollout. But yeah, we, I think our key challenge is to try and uh, change that mindset into something that uh, allows these communities to operate long term and grow over time. And yet, yeah, it's not that the system gets installed and then it uh, is not working after two years. It's after two years, it's, the system is even bigger. Yeah. Um, and this is, there are solar home systems installed as part of this project. You know how I said it's plug and play and modular and you can connect it like Lego. So your question was, what is the difference in a centralized grid and a mesh grid, right? So centralized grid, um, you install in one spot. So let's say here, right? You put your generation, your storage, um, and you're taking power from here, right? Let's, let's just think about this in the most basic way. You have to take power from here all the way to here. And so, and all of the power is going from here to here, right? So let's say, how, do you know how big the system was, Oscar? How many kilowatts? The total kilowatt size. Uh, like 40 kilowatts? Uh, 30, 36 or something, yeah. So 36 kilowatts of power has to travel from here to here, right? And so that means you're going to have a lot of um, power loss unless you really increase the voltage. So you step up the voltage to make sure that you don't lose the power and that costs money. And also you need to use like thicker cables. So that's why centralized um, is a bit complicated and you have to take cables all the way from here to here. Whereas in the mesh grid, all right, let's look at this mesh right now. So these houses are close to each other. So they are now connected in a mesh. There's like 300 watts here, 300 watts here, 300 watts here, 300 watts here. So when this house needs power, it's only taking power from here to here. So since the power doesn't travel far and it's only a small amount of power, you've got much less power loss, right? So you can use lower voltage distribution and lower thickness cables, which is much lower cost. And then think about it. We haven't even drawn any cables from here. All of this cable, right? All of this cable we're saving, to one half. right? Because there's no point. And then we've just connected this house separately as a standalone system. And if we want, like maybe next year, if all like many, many houses pop up here, we can just plug them in together. And so that's the difference in the mesh versus the centralized. And you mean, this is mini grid? No, this is a, the mesh grid. Mesh grid, oh, sorry. And the mini grid is the uh, centralized one. Oh, I see. So, cool. Um, Any more questions from the audience on Zoom? Cool. So, um, what, do you, which, um, what, what, what do you think are the next steps that UNDP could work on with Opera in this? Uh, on this one, I think we will study more about whether we can expand to the nearby uh, village, but we are in the discussion with the, with the MME one. And second is about the develop the business model that you will get your input also how we can uh, uh, marketing this technology further and how the get the, the input from the the EDC especially uh, ref fund uh, how we can uh, leverage those available money that they're going to use on the uh, unsustainable technology in the solar rooftop and so uh, home system uh, system desk. 
Um, cool. And I, I was told that you, like I've seen a number of UNDP case studies, right? Is it possible for us to um, put put something together with the with the data from I'll just stick some people in the chat with the data from from our crop? Yes, certainly. Uh, we will be using uh, in the next uh, few months. It is going to be very critical for us to develop this business model and also approach in parallel different sources of finance as well. One option that we've been thinking is to look at GCF funding, Green Climate Fund. But this is going to be a very long process. That's why we were a bit quite worried. A uh, lot of information, a lot of data is needed to, to, like 22 million is a good number to go with, right? Have you talked to, uh, are you talking independently to GCF? or through the, the current? Not initiated any communication at this stage, but uh, initially we were thinking to, okay. to approach GCF, but looking at the scale of money that is needed, um, it's a very small amount of money for GCF to fund. Yeah. Um, maybe we can think about the one is to four. If, if we have about, we need uh, seven, eight million from them, but equal amount of money or four times to that money, Four to six times to that money need to be mobilized from private sector or parallel investment. Is GCF a debt facility or? Uh, it's a grant facility. Oh, really? um, and they also look at non grant financing instruments. That's where we are not much in, in, in that space. But anyway, we can discuss that more um, of the thing. Uh, we've been also thinking about linking with. The IEEs and at least make a change for some of these IEEs to be the producer of the energy, right? Uh, there's a small change that is needed through electricity regulation that can really help us to liberate some sources of finance, right? At least IEEs could invest on their own uh, with additional little grant here and there. Uh, that's one of the potential options as well um, to, to look forward to. Um, so these are the few ideas that we have um, in, in making sure, but the sustainability of this particular one that we have at this point of time, we're not worried about the system for next two years in terms of its operational maintenance and also longevity of it uh, once the community get full hands on that system. Uh, would it be possible for us to make a supra REE? just to look at these microgrids. That's also one of the areas that we need to explore. Uh, and if this will be part of the, uh, one of the business models that we are going to explore as part of the work that we are going to initiate. Um, definitely, we are going to work very closely with you in shaping these models uh, further um, so that we can approach different institutions in parallel to make a, a bit of a political leverage as well, mainly EDC here. Uh, and REF fund, if we can make a difference, I think that, that can really liberate. For them, they're giving about $100 million per year as an, a subsidy for electrification. So it would be easier for them to invest a little amount of money instead of investing on solar home systems. This kind of models can bring in a lot of additionality. Um, I think that's a, a potential case. Uh, this is a convincing thing that we could meet EDC. So do you think, so this is the plan that we had outlined, which was um, all of this that you're talking about, right? Which is the different options. Um, the option where the REF funds it directly, the option where uh, we get funding from the GCF or like, uh, you know, a, D a DFI, for example, um, creating a super RE. All of these options, do you think um, it's possible to um, come up with basically like a short report, right? Where you're like, this pilot project was completed. These are the data outputs in terms of the cost of delivering the project, the time it took to complete it, the impact, the energy consumption, the load growth potential. Um, and also in addition, here are some potential recommendations to explore. Um, can we get something like that out um, we don't need to even stipulate our specific, you know, OCRA. We can just say that this type of technology um, enabled these outputs. Um, I think having something like that out would create a bit of, um, you know, 
like something for people to look at and and, and discuss, right? All, all the regulators, and then we can work around that to the next next step of getting uh, the stakeholders to hopefully agree to a plan. Yeah, I, I totally agree with this uh, idea. I think we need to operate it in for a number of months before we can get uh, earlier right. I think ideally after our initial phase uh, two year, right? Two, two years is too late. <laughs> not... the, the landscape, the, the another issue is um, in terms of the rural electrification, things can change very drastically. Yeah. Um, that's also one of the five uncertainty that, that we need to deal with. What are the villages that are that can be prioritized through this kind of systems? Um, provided if EDC is clear in its approach of electrifying through grid, um, then we, we can plan ourselves with this kind of activities. But a lot of uncertainty exists at the uh, operator level, right? Uh, EDC mainly. Uh, that's also one of the issues that we need to deal with in, in moving forward. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, in the next four months, we'll have greater clarity what kind of models that we can work with. And maybe we may have to have a multi-pronged approach, uh, partially splitting between uh, different models so that at least we can see some uh, organic growth. Otherwise, if we stick with one model, it's going to be a big, uh, what, a long process. What I do think. you mean, sorry, multiple models? Um, partly work with some of the IEEs to make a change at the regulator level. IEEs could be the generator. That's one of the approach. Um, some would be like a community-owned initiative where community gets the licensing from EAC. Um, if they can form a committee, the same as the one that we have done, a similar approach, that could be also one way forward. Um, in the business as usual case, they, they are spending about 51 cents, right? And in the case of uh, this microgrid, it is going to be about 39 or 30 even, if they can reduce the cost of uh, the operation maintenance cost. Uh, that can give a bit leverage for community to themselves to be the ownership. Uh, and they can be the owners of uh, the oper operators of the of the microgrid. Um, the other one is to donor. A few donors may also like to fund, continue to fund um, potential donors like um, DFAT or EU. Uh, then, in such a case, we can also route some of this to some of the villages as well on priority. Yeah, I just feel like the time horizon needs to be considered. Like it's what, 20, 2022 now? No, it's 2020, 2021, yeah. <laughs> 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 the time is going fast, right? And That's the problem. And initially we were thinking to also develop a GCF project and including some non-grant financing instruments. That's more attractive for them, but to, we don't know how many days uh, or how many months or years it may take uh, by the time we receive the fund, right? Uh, and there is a lot of uncertainty as well. We link up private investments with GCF. If we are running slow, private investments can go ahead. Then that's, that's not the real purpose, right? At the end of the day, GCF really, we will land up in problem with the GCF project implementation. So we don't actually have a problem in getting funding. Right, we we know multiple funders. Like two of our investors are six sixty billion dollar companies, right? So we can get private sector funding. We have a problem with the 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 way that the regulatory structure is working right now. So I think, um, yeah, if if UNDP can put their weight behind the project that UNDP actually supported and say that this is a project we did, these are the findings that we have, these are some options that you can use to go forward. Uh, that would really help us in getting to the next stage with the regulators. And then when we come to the regulators, you know, maybe the REF says, look, we can, maybe this is what they say. Maybe they're like, look, we can do it, but we might need another, you know, $2 million of grant. And then we can provide, then we can commit to um, paying for this because, all right, all right, let's look at it like this. I don't think we necessarily want to do this, but if you look at it like this, it's like, okay, SHS would have cost $16 million. Okra is going to cost $22 million. SHS 
gives 250 watt hours, Okra gives 930. SHS lasts for two years, right? Okra is maintained on an ongoing basis. So maybe the REF goes, all right, if you give us $7 million of grant, then it doesn't make a difference, right? So these are the things that we can do, but we need to, um, I think, I think that's the next step. I think the first step would be this project happened, the preliminary results are this, and here are some options that we can use to, to scale out. And then we need to get into the same room with um, MME, EDC, EAC, and basically say, all right, here are some things that we wanna cooperate on to move this forward, um, and then have an agreement so it's on paper. Otherwise, it's kind of like everyone's you know, j just doing their own thing and has their own different ideas. We need to get on the same page. I think that's where UNDP can do a really good job because one, your name, but also, you know, you guys have good uh, relationships there with all these um, people. So that, I think that, that, that would be really awesome to see. I think we uh, looked at, particularly at REF as being a kind of natural home for this, right? Because that's where, yeah, they're rolling out solar home systems. It's very similar. Um, but we, I don't think, have really had many inroads with the REF. So I think that that's probably another area where if you and if it does, or you can kind of uh, help us connect more strongly with them, I think that, that will also be valuable. Um, yeah, we've obviously done, you yeah, know, a lot of work now with MME, so we have a good relationship with them, but uh, it doesn't seem as though MME would be necessarily the ones to roll out 237 villages. They're kind of the wrong stakeholder uh, to approach for that. But if we can uh, kind of look through EDC and the RAF and say, okay, uh, these are the programs that you kind of have planned, um, you know. Consider this alternative technology instead. You're going to save X amount of money um, and just get a sense for what their blockers are or what their philosophy is. Because I, I mean, Aki maybe knows more, but I, I don't really have a good sense of what the REF's drivers really are and uh, you know, where the money is primarily coming from and so forth. Yeah. Certainly, Oscar. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Julian, uh, since you are listening to this conversation, and um, what would be the way forward that you think from having seen this kind of uh, projects implementation in Cambodia for a while, uh, what options that could be uh, best in, in, in terms of our betting in? Julian? Sorry to put you on spot. Gone, gone to the toilet. I think it's still mute. I'm not sure I can see that. Oh, sorry, is there? All, all of you and the people? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, cool. They're mostly on. Hi, Sonny. Any final reflections from you, having seen this? Sonny is in the room over there. Uh -huh. <laughs> hi, hi, good. Yeah, I, I think it's um, a lot of a lot of things. Hi, Sonny. We can hear you. And can you hear me? Can you hear me now? No. Okay. Uh, did you? No. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry, in the room, we can't hear here uh, for some reason. Okay. I see. Can you hear me now, Butch? Okay, so can you speak now? Can you, can you hear me now, Butch? Yeah. Butty? Okay. Okay. That's so slow. Bong, Bong Sonny, I could hear you clearly, but I'm not so well from the room. 
it's not working. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how the system works. Hey, can you hear me now? Can you can you hear sound on yours, Butch? I can hear. I can hear if you want. Yeah, here we can hear. Mute this one. I'm sorry, so maybe more because of my internet. And I'm going to say something. Oh, can everybody hear? Okay, uh, can everybody hear us? Uh, I think maybe we have to conclude our learning session today. And thank you so much, the Afi and the police here. Very happy to meet you too. And Tri also with Afi. And thank you also, participants on the Zoom that uh, participate today. Although we have some technical issues, or some that we cannot communicate very well over the Zoom. One, one way. But we still keep, uh, I think we are working more with the RP on uh, this project and further. So I had to conclude the session. Thank you so much. All. Awesome. Yeah, and thanks a lot, all of the UNDP team. I only really worked with Butch, um, Butchie, and Sonny, but yeah, thanks for everyone. You guys you know, supported an awesome project, and hopefully we can scale this out soon. So have a great day, everyone. Okay, the presentation will be shared to all of you. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you.